Welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode number 343. My name is Brando. With us today, thankfully no one with an S name. If you're watching this on Zoom, I have my fake tooth in. We'll see how uh, Slash sells seashells by the seashore, how, uh, how well I do this. First, my co-host who helped set up this interview with Mr. Tony Hornell, David Brody, uh, executive producer for the Elvis Duran Morning Show in New York City. And how many affiliates do you have? Around? Oh, 75 or 76, something like that. I mean, that's why when people say I'm successful, I'm like, no, look at David Brody. Look at Elvis Duran. David, oh, no. David, David's a famous guy. Oh, please. Cut it out, Tony. Uh, I work with a famous guy, as the saying goes. You know, his name's on the shirt. Uh, speaking of which, Tony's <laughs> name is on my shirt. If you, if you get to watch this video on YouTube, I'm wearing a Tony Hornell tour shirt. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm executive producer, and I also host two podcasts, the Brooklyn Boys podcast, where we complain about shit all day, uh, <laughs> and uh, from a New Yorker's perspective, and then uh, the Walkers and Talkers podcast, where we talk about The Walking Dead for uh, an hour and a half every week. So oh, I could, I could get into that. Me too. All right. uh, maybe yeah. I'll, I'll have to save, uh, do a part two. It's so funny because you, you might be wondering, wow, no wonder David and Brando get along because, you know, me being like an angry Jew from Brooklyn and I love The Walking Dead. I've talked about it on this, on this podcast, but David has not only helped me get this job from Premier Radio Networks at iHeartRadio, helped me get this interview with Tony Hornell. I figured, Tony, the least I can do is give him a guest you know, co-hosting spot. That's the least I can do for giving me a job and a podcast. You're the one that said, why don't you put it on iHeartRadio? I didn't think of it until David Brody came along. Yeah, so well, enough about me. We have a guy in the bottom box there we should be talking about. Right. <laughs> I know, I'm bringing him in. I'm bringing All him right. in. Well, here's a long name, Tony Hornell's Rock Singer Society. Is that your full name? No, that's that's my that's my vocal course. So I'm just using, uh, oh, maybe I should use, well, that's fine. We're here. You, we'll talk about that. We can talk about that. That's what I use my Zoom for primarily. Well, one of the few, uh, many things we're going to talk about with you, because um, I was talking to Brody this morning about, we were both excited about uh, just to talk to you today about your upcoming, um, you're in the middle of it, your acoustic tour and electric, you're, you're splitting, which is really cool. I want to go into that, but you just announced today, you know what? Fuck this. I'm taking out this, this fake tooth. I can't do it. I want to talk about your voice. I, I can't have a lisp, lispy voice when I talk to a Hall of Famer now, to the, the Metal Hall of Fame, right? You just got inducted. It's going to be a live ceremony. Let's read your, actually, the, the announcement. You can finally spill the beans, so I want to know how long you've known. It's a huge oh. honor to be inducted to the Metal Hall well, of Fame. Well, they, first of all, it's a, it's a huge honor. Uh, they actually let me know that they were talking about it a couple of years ago before COVID. Mm. And uh, then they asked me again this year, and they—they, they, uh, I, I don't think they're having the ceremony, so they're going to do it on stage at M3, which is May. I perform on May 7th at M3, so they're going to do it on stage, and they're actually going to induct a few other artists that are on the festival. So that's, I mean, a Mazel Tov, congratulations. <laughs> I mean, this is just a, that's an, that's an honor. I mean, you, a yeah. metal voice, a Hall of Fame voice, you know, as I struggle with mine right now. I mean, what, yeah. does that, what does that mean to you? Well, what I love about this particular organization is that they do some great charity work. Um, you should go to their website and check it oh. out, Metal, metal Hall of Fame. Uh, and I apologize for not knowing off the top of my head if it's .net or .com, but um, – I mean, Ronnie James Dio is in there. There's some, you know, there's some really amazing people to uh, to kind of be next to in any capacity, you know. So it's pretty pretty much amazing. What does it mean to me? I mean, I guess it just means that maybe at some point in my life I did something that people took notice of, and uh, you know, it, it's cool because it's. Uh, the board that votes is probably made up of uh, people in the business and my peers. And so, yeah, it feels pretty cool. And, uh, it, you know, it's kind of amazing because in 2019, I was the, uh, the first and I think still only American inducted into the Norwegian Popular Music Hall of Fame. Um, wow. So it's kind of just one of these bizarre and wild things, uh, you know, that that it it's amazing you know it's like i mean 
especially considering that TNT was was not uh, a huge band in this in the U.S. You know, we did do quite well in Norway. We did very well uh, in Norway and Scandinavia, and we did very well in Japan, and we did well here. Um, it's just such a big country. So, but uh, anyway, it feels great. It's great that I'm still out there doing it, and it's nice to be acknowledged. You know, for people who say it's it, they don't care. Um, my 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 guess is that they they are so big <laughs> that it, I don't know. I mean, most people I think in some somewhere deep down inside, it's it, they think they care. So well, it's it's dot org by the way. I did I did look it up. There you go. I got it's dot org. Yeah. Uh, you, you you slipped in a line that always reminds me of the movie Singles, which I'm sure you've seen. Mm. Where um uh th what's his name Dylan um the, the lead of, yes Matt Dylan Matt Dylan he he's talking about his band it's a grunge band and it's basically it's Pearl Jam with him as the lead singer in the movie and his whole catchphrase in the movie is dick. yeah he goes we're, we're yeah we're huge in Belgium right yeah. that's 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 his well, line so whenever you when you say you're huge in Norway it reminds me of that but yeah. obviously TNT much bigger than that that band in the movie you you were big a lot of places and why do you think Japan attracted so much attention to you guys well for one thing all of the 80s bands that had melody were were doing really well in japan i think also the intuition album which is the one that really broke pretty big over there um it was uh you know it was kind of the lyrics intuition it was kind of i was reading a lot of eastern philosophy and kind of buddhism and that kind of thing and i think the lyrics kind of reflected that and maybe they connected with that on some level uh more than other places i really don't know you know while while our peers were writing about uh girls and cars and sex and uh you know i was writing about uh, trusting your intuition and uh following your heart and things like that so uh corny or cheesy maybe i don't know but um definitely different than the other bands uh, we were different musically and we were different lyrically and uh maybe that was uh, part of the reason we weren't as big in the, in america but um we were unique <laughs> well the intuition album came out in 1989 and that's when i started dating my wife uh at, at the time and i think i've mentioned this to you but that that album was the soundtrack of our summer that was our tonight i'm falling and intuition those were like major make out in the car songs wow. those were like look into each other's eyes songs uh wow. that you know had major resonance in our lives so uh lyrically musically vocally of course a big part of of our lives so um so it's thank amazing. you for that you know thank you for telling me that it's amazing <laughs> to hear. it's ma it's amazing to hear because you know um i've got a few albums they asked me recently i did a thing for a uh, uh uh, website melodic melodic.net or something and they asked me about my the five life-changing albums and it's just amazing you know i'll be driving and hear something on the radio and and you know it's been said a million times before but there's just something about music that's like a snapshot of your life and it takes you right back if for example if elton john's uh island girl comes on the radio I literally, it's for some reason that song takes me not only to a time, but literally a place where I'm in a car with my aunt and we're driving around a corner at the beach. That's how specific that song and melody is. So there's a lot of songs like that, but I'm just saying like, it's incredible how much you know, you'll snap on something and just say, I remember that moment. It's like, uh, when I first heard No One Like You by the Scorpions, I was already a Scorpions fan. I used to leave the radio on all night long on low. And, and that song woke me up about four o'clock in the morning. It was probably their first time playing it. And they're like, this is a brand new song from the Scorpions. You know, I just, those are the kinds of things you, you just never forget. I'm glad that TNT gives us a snapshot of Brody making out with his soon to be wife. That is just a, a lasting but, legacy to your music. Uh, more important than the Metal Hall of Fame, I think, helping uh, Brody get his, his mojo going. <laughs> were, 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 was it responsible for any uh, children? <laughs> no, no, no. But I, but I. That was know more. The, that was yeah. more Marvin Gaye, right? Than, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, you know what? Uh, the, the we really listened to at least the first five or six years of dating and, and engagement was all metal. 
it was all metal and, and progressive rock like Rush. Uh, you know, we listen, she loves Billy Joel. And, uh, you know, we all, we love rock and classic rock, but it was something about that, that era, the eighties, you know, we had leather jackets and long hair and we listened to, to your music. And so, um, no, no baby making music. Cause that was, that was a good 12, 13 years later, but, uh, <laughs> but we, we got there thankfully because of your music. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. so, so we were the catalyst for the babies. I'm not, so. I'm not going to swear. We didn't, we didn't, uh, have intimacy during <laughs> some, of the, some of the albums, but, uh, yeah, yeah, we did well. We've, we've played them out. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Tony, since you have such a great memory, and to go back b b before about when you found out about being inducted into the Metal Hall of Fame in a snapshot in time, and you mentioned it was before the pandemic. You know, obviously you're still performing at a high level. What? Did, how did you take that nomination at that time when the world was very unsure about how it was going to go forward? And I guess how did you handle it? Uh, going forward did you look at it as like almost maybe like a retirement thing like can i even do this anymore are we allowed to have shows um how did you feel for those very i mean now things are obviously getting better but how did you feel for those those uh first few years of just the uncertainty of the world well the first year was just like you know i think like everybody i think our our heads and our our hearts were being pulled in so many directions at once and it was kind of like oh, this will be a couple weeks. I think we all knew that wasn't going to be the case, but we were hopeful, you know. So like like everybody, it was kind of like, oh, this is scary. Oh, this is bad, you know, washing everything. And uh, I mean, you know, just obviously looking at where we are now, uh, obviously, and we're still kind of in this very historical kind of thing and it, it affected the music community pretty badly um i don't know i think at first I, I was just going with it and then it became apparent that it was a problem and then it was sort of scary and what are we going to do and then i think at some point i just said oh well you know i'm just going to go with it and I saw a lot of my peers uh kind of getting almost frantic about putting out music um I felt this pressure after a little, after a month or so of, oh, I better do something. And uh, uh, I did, I did some Facebook uh, live streams and, and they were fun, you know, and then I kind of moved on from there. And I did put one song out with a project called Echo Bats, which was uh, with Joel Hoxtra. He and I wrote this song, uh, a really great song actually called Save Me From Loving You. And that came out in the summer of 2020 with a really cool video that was sh I shot my parts in London. I happened to be in London for the first uh, six months of the pandemic or so. Um, you know, it was just, it was, it was emotionally, the whole thing was just emotionally draining and psychologically uh, challenging. And I think, uh, you know, for me in particular, I, I got I, I got past that frantic feeling of having to put something out like everybody else was doing. And I just said, you know, I don't want to make music that way. Um, I don't have a, a current record company. I don't have a deal in place. So there's really, there's, there's no pressure. You know, I can, I've done enough, I think, that I can just sort of wait until I'm ready to make music. I don't have to do it just because. If I was in the same boat as a lot of other artists and had uh, a really great label behind me and the budget to do a record, I absolutely would have gone in and, and taken my time and made a record. And uh, and by the way, the Scorpions made a great record during the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan and uh, as I mentioned them before, and I, I think their last record was amazing. So yeah. I think um, it was a time of reflection and, uh, and, and, and insecurity, you know, and, and here we are. And I think that uh, for me, I can only speak for myself. I definitely feel like the world is different and I'm not sure it's ever going to be the same. And I'm not sure that's a bad thing, but what's going on right now uh, in so many different ways, whether it be the war in Ukraine or the war at home, uh, there's just so much going on that is uh, different than before. <laughs> so, 
Sure. That's why I try to provide a little uh, escape on here by you know talking about fun things. Well, we got yeah. Serious. We'll talk when it gets serious. We'll, we'll we'll do it. We'll handle it. But I'm glad you uh, mentioned the Echo Bats because I was watching that video earlier today, right in your your website, TonyHarnell.com. Plug for you. Uh, right next, right next to it is the Judas Priest cover, Before yeah. the Dawn. And I go to click on it. You know, it's a great cover. I nothing less is expected. But what I didn't expect was the the I don't know. You gave like a a love letter to Judas Priest in like the in the instrument. Rob. Yeah. Yeah. So what does Judas Priest mean to you? And almost tie it back to when we're talking about the Hall of Fame that I know we were talking about the Metal Hall of Fame, but for them, they are metal. They should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They're not. Maybe this year. But we can live in a world where Eminem is in the Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and Judas Priest is not. So I'm just curious your thoughts on that in addition to what they mean to you and what Rob means to you. Well, I was always a music fan. I've been singing since I was, since as far back as I can remember. My mother was an opera singer. So when I was, uh, you know, um, developing in the womb, I was hearing her sing a lot. She was pretty young when I was born. So uh, she was uh, both performing and studying her voice, studying opera. So uh, I, I heard it inside and I got a lot of it when I came out into the world. And so um, music was all around me and it was very natural, I think, for me to start singing and to hear hear music and just have it a neat, I don't know, instinctive understanding. My ear was kind of naturally, I just naturally gravitated toward it and I understood on some level naturally what it was and how to do it on to some degree but uh and I was always a music fan from as far back as I can remember I had if I loved Glenn Campbell which was my first hero when I was uh five four five six seven years old I had to have every record I learned every song I sang every song and I listened all the time me sitting in front of the record player listening to music was a big part of my early childhood and my childhood all the way all the way through to adulthood it was music so along the way there was there was you know might have started with uh whatever was going on in the house folk music 60s you know a beatles always the beatles um and uh and then you know i this glenn campbell period i went through and uh that led to getting into the rock stuff that was going on when led zeppelin and all that stuff came out and, um, you know, the radio, the Eagles, and so on. But at some point along the way, in junior high school, a buddy of mine who played guitar, he was playing some stuff that I, it was heavier than what I was used to hearing on the radio. It was, it was like Led Zeppelin and, you know, plus. It was like Black Sabbath plus. Like, what is that, you know? Oh, this is um, metal, you know? And I never even heard the term before. My mom called it acid rock when I, brought the records home for the first time but he gave me two albums and and this was uh I still talk to this he's still like one of my best friends ever um and he gave me Judas Priest Stein, uh, Stained Class and he gave me Rainbow Rising and I just kind of lost my mind with these two albums and I especially both of them pretty pretty equally but I was a little more drawn to uh Rob's voice. I love Dio. And so the vocals on both were just ridiculous, but there was just something a little extra wild and extreme about Rob Halford. And I had to know more. And so I dug in and my assessment of it looking back is that I think there was something operatic, obviously, about his approach and, and about the music. And it was dramatic and it was big. Um, and I think that that was part of it looking back. I didn't know it at the time, but I think there was something to that. Also being a skateboarder and a surfer and being into extreme things and extreme sports growing up in California, um, I think I always had this attitude that nothing is worth doing unless I can, uh, unless it's like really, really crazy. And I heard his voice and I was just like, I always sang and people, you know, that heard me. I didn't let a lot of people hear me, always complimented me, but I never thought about taking it seriously until then. And then I started to get serious about guitar and it just kind of developed from there. And I just started to sing 
to those records in, in my first car that I had when I was 16 to and from the beach. Um, and it just bit me. Like, I, I can't even explain it. I just became incredibly obsessed with that kind of music and in particular Judas Priest and Rob Halford. And that helped shape a big part of my vocal style that then would kind of merge and blend with other things I loved like Journey and you know Steve Perry, Steve Perry and uh, Lou Graham and, and Brad Delp and all the other great singers, uh, Paul McCartney and Don Henley that I had grown up with. Did, did you ever get to tell Rob Halford that story or what he's meant to you? In a very kind of it rushed way. I had so many things I wanted to talk to him about. And I had, we got to play with them at Sweden Rock in 2014. And I brought, when they put that box set out um, with the studded box around the outside of it, uh, I brought that with me and had him sign it. And uh, we had a, a brief chat, but I was, I was nervous. I knew he was rushed. So I didn't get to really dig into it, but uh yeah, that's that. Oh, it'll happen hopefully one day. Well, I, I got to meet him twice. Uh, he had come up to the uh, production house that I was working at, so I, yeah. I would work at another job after the radio show in the morning, where my department would write song parodies and comedy uh, for radio. And then the rest of the place was syndicated rock shows and they always had celebrities and news people. It was a, a big deal as far as who would walk down the hallway. And so one day we, we hear that I'm not a fan, but Lou Dobbs, the uh, newsman was in the halls and he, he had done, a, he does a show, he had a studio there that he did his radio show from. And then about an hour later, we hear Judas Priest is doing, well, just Rob from Judas Priest is in the hallway across the hall in the studio doing a, a radio tour where he's just sitting there, you know, as you know, just doing radio station after radio station. And I got to go and say hi to him. And somebody walked in and said, um, I think he can meet you. And I said, so, and he's, they're talking to Rob and he goes, he, he can meet me really. And now Rob Halford is very excited about meeting Lou Dobbs, not because <laughs> he's a fan politically, but he's, he's yeah. watched him on American television. He wants to meet him. Mm -hmm. So we go down the hall. I'm talking to, to Rob about my love of Judas priest. And I walk him down the hall and I introduce him to Lou Dobbs, who was, a, I guess, sort of a coworker of mine <laughs> at the time. And he, he takes a picture with Lou and he's, he's kind of goofy, like a kid meeting a rock star that he's seen this guy on television for so long and they take a picture and I take the picture on my phone and uh, he tells people who, is, who are doing the tour, oh, send me that picture. Well, the people I work with never sent them the picture. So I don't know, about two years ago, which is maybe seven or eight years later, Rob is at the radio station at, at iHeartMedia in New York. And I go down the hall and I, I talk to him and I said, hey, I don't know if you remember this. I took the picture of you at Lou Dobbs. You're kidding me. He's, I never got that picture. I said, oh, well, I'd, I'd love to send it to you. How would I go about sending it to you? He goes, here's my email address. Send me the email. So I emailed him the picture. He wrote me back. I'm thrilled to have it. So basically the point of the story is, Tony, I can get your Rob Halford's email address is what I'm saying. <laughs> if you'd like I'm, to email him. I mean, I'm, 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 I, would, I would guess that there is some awareness of me on his part. But, oh, I'm uh, sure. He knows but, Lou but, Dobbs, so he knows you. <laughs> yeah, well, that yeah, because that's the same. No, <laughs> but but, uh, but anyway, yeah. So so it was a it was a huge. Uh, he was a huge part of my deciding to do this whole thing for real. That's brilliant, and that goes into my six degrees of uh, separation. Kevin Bacon, GNR Bacon. I met Lou Dobbs, I think, once when I worked at United Stations Radio Network. Yes, I've that's never, where I met him. Yes. Okay. I've never seen a man with more makeup on his face than him. Like, I'm Lou Dobbs. I'm like, I'm, I got to go to the bathroom. Can you get him away? Like, I didn't say that, but I thought that. Uh, He's an interesting character, Tony. He really yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I haven't met Rob Halford, but I've been lucky enough to have him on the show. Uh, not Zoom, just over the phone. And I played Six Degrees of GNR Bacon with him, and he told us this great story. It was a rumor. Rose didn't want him to have his motorcycle on stage when they did a whole festival together, and it was just a rumor. And he's a lovely fellow, all that. So I want to ask you before I forget uh, the, the shift, the, the name of the podcast. I know you've played with Bumblefoot. Do you have any other six degrees of GNR Bacon? Because you've obviously been around for a long time. Yes, I do. Um, a couple of things actually. We TNT 
it was playing and there's actually a post that I put up somewhere of uh, a marquee London, uh, the famous marquee club in London. Uh, there's a flyer of shows from 1987 and uh, there's a flyer where TNT is, had, is playing and then either the next night or the night after GNR is playing. And this was like their first European tour. Now, they hadn't broken open big yet with uh, Sweet Child of Mine, but the, the first song was, was getting some noise and people were starting to be aware of them. Um, but, you know, nobody was sure what was gonna happen at that point. It was, a lot of bands were coming out at that time that were, you know, they were a little different. They were something to look at and something to take notice of. Um, but uh, but we were driving, we were riding around in London and we literally, I think we were shopping for boots, which is what we often did. We would go to Kensington Market and look for rock and roll boots, you know. And we saw the band walking down the street. We're like, oh, that's that that band, Guns N' Roses, you know. And it's not really a significant story. It's just uh, something I'll never forget because we had no idea they were going to end up being one of the biggest bands in the world ever, you know, uh, who would. Um, and then uh, the, other, the other thing was, okay, so in the 80s, I, I would often go to the, the cat club and I would uh, hang out till pretty late, probably doing things I shouldn't be doing as part of my late night hang, hanging out. And we would often go from... Uh, from there to this other place where bands would often jam and I ended up at this place and somewhere along the way I started uh, I, I was hanging out with Izzy Stradlin and we ended up at some other place called the Scrap Bar and we were chilling and having some drinks and then we both went to this uh, place called The Loft and I was singing some blues probably pretty badly I was probably uh, inebriated and Axel came in with a notepad. They were working on uh, the double album, the Use Your Illusion albums. And he sat right in front of me with a notepad. Um, and uh, within a very short period of time, he left. And then probably within the next few weeks or month, there was a, uh, an article. They used to have this little thing in the front of, I think it was either Hit Parader, one of those magazines, they had this little news blurbs in the front like little stupid things that happened that month you know and it was like uh you know tony harnell was singing at this uh, little place in new york city and axel walked in and i guess it was you know they tried to spin it into i was like singing so great that he left the building you know and <laughs> it was always this kind of a joke um among all of us that you know they, they actually found that to be newsworthy that I had sang him out of the room, you know, which I'm sure I was absolutely horrible. And, and, and it was a drunken situation <laughs> that I wouldn't be proud of today, but. Clickbait goes back before the internet. Is this making up shit before the, you know, oh, with, without you know, rhyme or reason. Do you remember why he had the, uh, the notepad at all? I believe that was just to, you know, from what I remember, they were spending time in different cities making that album. Uh, and what I remember reading is that they wanted to, Axel in particular, wanted to capture the energy of each city and write songs when they were, so they were just hanging out in different cities writing songs and trying, I guess, hey, maybe I, maybe he got a lyric out of, uh, out of that situation if he found himself in that night. <laughs> Maybe. That's maybe. great. Hey, Tony, you mentioned two of your first albums were Judas Priest and Rainbow. And those are two bands that didn't always have Rush the same. Rush 2112. That was Rush 2112. So I'll leave them out of this, what I'm going with, because they've always yep. had the same singer. But Judas, Rob Halford left Judas Priest for a while and they recorded without him. Yeah. And Rainbow replaced their singer with Jolyn Turner, completely different sound, and they were successful. Yeah. And some bands can do it and some can't. For me, Bruce Dickinson is the singer of Iron Maiden. I know he wasn't the first, but he's the definitive. And when he left, I have no interest in hearing the music that he didn't say, right? And I'm like that with a lot of bands. I'm like that with TNT. So uh, I did the calculation. I think they're together 40 years. You're the lead singer, 25-ish of the 40 years. And for me, you're the definitive singer. 
And so my question is, I won't. I haven't even listened to the other albums. I just won't. Are there bands? I, I don't think I don't think I have from front to back either. Just a song here and there. Yeah. So I was going to ask you if it's weird hearing, you know, uh, other singers. But as you said, you don't do it. Um, who has the advantage? Because in my mind, other than Van Halen, the band is the band, but the singer is the sound, right? So if you hire some great musicians, you sound like TNT. But when TNT hires another singer, they sound like a band with another singer. As great as Ronnie is, you know, he has a unique sound. I, I always found, like, I follow the singer. When David Lee Roth split off, he still sounded like Van Halen to me, right? Van Halen sounded like something else with Sammy. So who do you think has the advantage in keeping the sound or the fan base when something like that happens? It depends. It's, it's not black and white. Like with Van Halen, uh, um, they were very, very smart about it. And they got, uh, they got a great singer. They had a good rapport with him and they wrote great songs. And Eddie is Eddie. And it's a rarity. And, and the band still sounded like Van Halen. I mean, Alex has a very, very uh, recognizable drum sound. And, and so, yeah, um, the backing vocals and all that. So... Um, that was a weird, rare situation. I think yep. Black Sabbath with Dio is also another good example of two, two eras of the band that are just very loved, you know, and, and some people go more for the Dio era, some go for more for Ozzy. And right. some like, I, like me, I like both. Whenever I hear uh, Old Sabbath with Ozzy, I crank it up. And if I hear Dio, which is, sure. to be honest, more rare, I crank that up. Right, but um, when Motley Crue doesn't have Vince Neil, it's not Motley Crue. But there are some bands like that yeah. where it's just, it becomes more of a, I don't know if it's like a personality thing, you know, uh, it's just that's what the fans want to see. I think with TNT, it could have gone in a, in a better way um, when I wasn't there. Um, and I think they did some good music with Tony Mills. Um, and I, I liked Tony and I knew Tony, um, but uh, I don't know the advantage. I think the only thing I could say, and this is all just borrow from, uh, from Irving Azoff uh, in the, that he uh, quote from the Eagles documentary, song power. And I think, I think that's probably what, what I have in, in the, in the context of TNT is that I co-wrote the songs that most people know and I sang them on the on the records um and uh you can't take that away from me <laughs> no 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 but you know what some people get typecast like I always say David Schwimmer on Friends will always be Ross you know yeah. Bob Denver always was upset he would always be Gilligan even though he had huge success on Gilligan's Island he was Gilligan and yeah. so listen Henry, you've been Henry, Henry Winkler Fonzie yeah He's the Fonz. I mean, he, it took him 30 years of not acting, really, to become the character he is on Barry to kind of wipe the slate clean. You've yeah. been in other bands, uh, uh, Westworld, Starbreaker, uh, Morningwood. You know, you, you've put out some great music. I own all of it. Um, but, uh, of course, you will, you'll always be known as the lead singer to TNT in many people's minds. Is that a, is that a, a blessing or is it a curse or is it both at some times? It's uh, both. That, that, yeah. It's both. It's and a lot of it is my own my own doing. Um, you know, I had some great uh, some great music outside of uh, of of TNT. Um, some of it is is not my own doing. Some of it I just made great music and it didn't get promoted the same way, or the timing wasn't as good, um, or uh, it was run poorly. You know, uh, which was the case many times with TNT as well. Uh, just not good business practices um both from the band and those working with the band um bad decision making and so forth so i often say i could be a a great um uh, and i have done it uh, i have done some motivational stuff uh with uh music schools and things like that and i i find sometimes that by making a lot of mistakes in the business you have a lot more to teach young artists you know um if you were just successful and there was never a bump in the road and i mean oh well uh, i just happened to uh you know i mean if everything went great for me after the after i signed uh 
my first major label record deal with TNT. I was 21 years old. I had paid some dues. I had worked really hard from, from the time I decided to sing for real until we got our record deal. But if everything just went boom, I'm sure I would have screwed something up. Um, you know, uh, the bigger that you are, the more screw ups you get, you know, um, and it, it tends to, you know, not kill, not to, well, could kill you physically, but it doesn't tend to kill your career if you uh, continue to bounce back from it. But um, I got off track. What was your question? <laughs> oh, it's okay. You, actually, you said some great things. I was just saying, being known as the lead singer of TNT, even oh, when yeah. you're not, and you're yeah. in other bands, blessing yeah. or a curse obviously yeah. it brings attention to your other bands yeah i think i think the biggest thing i'm finding now is when i go to rehearse the tnt material i love doing my acoustic shows because it's a blend i don't just hold back and sing you know kumbaya the whole night i mean i'm really you know uh singing strong and singing high on my acoustic shows but not the whole show there's a lot of relaxed, mellow, emotional, textural kind of stuff, you know. And, uh, you know, when I go back to rehearse the TNT stuff, it's always like, what was I thinking, you know, when I was in my 20s? And I, I wasn't thinking ahead to how hard this was going to be when I got older. <laughs> so that's probably one of the biggest curses. And also the fact that I've recorded and written more music outside of TNT than in TNT. And a lot of it, I think is more mature, shows growth uh, and, and development as an artist that a lot of people don't know who, who follow me, even on socials and who like my work with TNT. Um, I think for a lot of people, what I did stops around uh, 92, but that was really the beginning, you know, uh, for, for what I ended up doing creatively. And these are great questions brody this is why i have you here <laughs> and it, the, the bounce i mean i'm being serious, but think about it uh, obviously from the guns of roses standpoint the amount of lineup changes i mean it's only now that we uh yeah. we have a somewhat of a band to, to talk about but to revert back to the to tony another band that you've been a part of another band that's gone through so many lineup changes uh skid row announcing another recent another new lead singer as the wheel turns i mean do you have a thought on that i mean can you reflect on your time in uh skid row like because no, I, I, I won't <laughs> reflect on my time but i will say that i think that they made a great decision and i think uh i've, I've admired eric from afar and i think it's the best choice they could have possibly made at this stage of the game and i i think if there was ever going to be i mean look everybody knows what they want with that particular situation but it doesn't look like it's ever going to happen so in lieu of that happening i think this was a very smart and innovative idea for them to grab a younger guy um who has a lot of fire on stage and he has a great voice very versatile um so i you know i'm i'm impressed and I think it's a great choice. That's that's really what I can all I can say. <laughs> well, you were you were only in Skid Row for a very brief period of time, but you replaced Sebastian. Bach. I always say a few hours. Yeah, I I, I I said a couple of months. We were talking beforehand. I yeah. said, you know, only in Skid Row for a few months, but you were in essence, uh, and you did record um, eighteen in life, right? You put out a, in twenty fifteen. You stepped into the role of the established singer, right? Sebastian it was Sebastian's band. People associate him with that band, no matter what he does. He's the lead singer of Skid Row in people's minds. Did it help you relate at all to like the guys who followed you in TNT were doing that for you? They were stepping in the way you stepped in for Sebastian. Did it give you kind of like, oh, I, I guess they're going through the same shit, you know, having to replace me and my band that you did going into Skid Row? Is it a different dynamic, I guess, or the it, same? It was, a little, it was a little different and a little weird because... Sebastian and I had a relationship going way back to the mid 80s, uh, to the late 80s, rather, when he joined uh, Skid Row. And I, before their record came out, I got to know him. We met at a Kiss um, concert in Manhattan, and he came running over to me, and uh, we, we, you know, we became buddies. And I went to his house sometimes, and we hung out uh, and had Mexican food in the city, and he played the he, he played me the the cassette of uh, skid row in a cab in a cab ride wow. 
going uptown one night. Um, and he was actually showing me parts of uh, some of the songs where he did some Tonyisms, you know. So he was he was a big fan of TNT and a big fan of mine. Um, and we were we were we were off and on close through the years. And it was a weird a weird thing to do, but I felt that it was a uh, yeah. And it was it was weird to be in that situation. I don't think I anticipated how how weird it would be. Um, and, uh, and a bit uncomfortable, to be honest. Um, I was, uh, uh, considered, uh, at one point, uh, when, when Rob Halford left, uh, my manager told me I was being considered for Judas Priest and, wow. you know, that would have been a huge dream for me because I knew the song so well, looking back on it, I'm kind of almost glad I didn't get the gig because, you know, it was, it was, it was hard to to be in the role i was in it's been um you know even more pressure and even harder i think for me to have filled the be with my you know the childhood history i have with you sure. would have been kind of like I, it could have broken my heart you know depending on the reaction of people it doesn't matter how good you how good you do the material it, it's you're not the guy right let's think about the movie rock star what it was based on and that's not even the best story that could have been told if Tony was the singer for Judas Priest. That could have been the best rock star movie ever. If that yeah. happened. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad you are where you are, where you are now. You know, well, would, well, you, yeah. would you have stepped into Journey? I don't know if I could have resisted. It would, <laughs> yeah. I would have probably regretted it after uh, a few shows and having some vocal issues because you don't get... The thing about a band like Journey... With, with TNT or Skid Row, in a live electric situation, you don't get, you can't get away with a lot, but you can kind of, you know, journey, you're not getting away with anything. You have to be, you just have to be perfect, you know, and, uh, the, and the pressure was too much for Steve and it was his own music, you know. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of interviews with him talking about the pressure that he felt to be like the record all the time. And wow. it was just a little too much for him. I, I understand it. Um, you know, in the 70s, you'd go see Led Zeppelin three different nights on a tour, and it was three different shows. And, how, uh, and Robert Plant would sing the songs three different ways. Um, that was kind of why you went to the shows in the 70s. In the 80s, that with MTV, it, that kind of that whole vibe changed. So in the 70s, you'd say, oh, what did they play? How did they play it? What did he sound like? Did, he do, did they jam? Um, in the 80s, the barometer for how good the band was, was this one statement that I absolutely hated, which was, they sounded just like the record. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you don't want that. And how, how, how unfortunate and boring that we had to do that. You know, and we we didn't want to do it. So we were one of the first bands because my band, I was the only one that sang harmonies on the records, and I would stack harmony upon harmony and a lot of tracks in the studio. Um, sometimes I'd bring in other singers to sing with me on those albums, like Jolyn Turner sang with me on uh, all the backing vocals on both Intuition and Tell No Tales. Um, sorry, yeah, am I right? Intuition and realized fantasies. Yeah, and um, happy thirtieth anniversary for that album, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but you know, uh, the guys in the band couldn't couldn't do that, so we had to use uh, backing tracks early in, in the eighties, and uh, because you know we had to sound like the record, you know. Right. So it was a little uh, daunting to have to have that pressure. I mean, Queen, can you imagine if Queen felt that way? They just kind of, I've, I've seen interviews where Freddie said, the record is one art form. The live show is a different art form. And I totally agree with that. And I think uh, if you, but if you were an 80s act, you have to still to this day, if you go out and play these shows, to the best of your ability, you have to try to adhere to that uh, Wow. unspoken unspoken rule you know well as someone who goes to see a lot of 80 shows and i'm sure brandon you, brando you, you'd, you'd agree with me a lot of those guys and i and by the way tony i saw you in february do your acoustic set so i know you can still sing but <laughs> so like i'm going to see uh uh poison def leopard and motley crew when they play city field 
And I've seen them all recently. You know, Joe Elliott can't sing like he can't sing like he used to. He struggles. But, you know, the band covers for him. Like you said, it's it's a rock show. They make the music louder. They The backing vocals. You you can't, when you do an acoustic set like what you did, you can't really hide in oh, a no. club where you're singing, right? No, but you're I, naked. I, right. Yeah. I don't expect Motley Crue to sound like Motley Crue anymore. I don't expect uh, Def Leppard to sound like the record. And they've been smart enough to add more acoustic songs to their to their set. Um they do uh, uh, montages. They'll do like, a, you know, so they'll do like a part of a song and they go another part of a song where you, you get the impression they're avoiding certain parts of the song. Uh, so they very cleverly uh, adjusted their age and their wear and tear to their performance. So, yeah, I, but you're right. I remember show, watching shows in the 80s. It was note for note. The guitar solos were note for note. And it was, wow, they did. I remember saying that and how stupid it sounds now to go, wow, they sounded just like the record. Yeah, I could have just bought the record. So, and yeah, you, yeah. Um, Tony, you must feel. Do you feel, I guess, empathy, or how do you feel towards your your compatriots, uh, like a Joe Elliott, or you know, recently John Bon Jovi is getting criticized, or Vince Neil, Axl Rose. It's not the record. I, but I wouldn't want to see anybody else in that slot. To go back to Skid Row or or to you, I want to I want to hear I want to see the person that sang it, even though if it may not be the same as the record. I want to experience yeah. that. I think uh, for the I think most fans are like that, and I think that if you put a replacement guy who can hit the notes perhaps uh, more youthfully than the person who wrote the songs and created the sound. Um, you know, it, there, you can do that, but I do think that most fans are, and I tell, I, t I work with singers and I tell them this all the time that uh, singers and tribute bands have it a lot harder than the original singer of any band that they did something with that reach people because the audience is going to be more forgiving if if i wrote if i sing Ten Thousand lovers i can do different things with the melody i can play around you know and i can and and it's okay um to a degree but if uh if, if somebody covering tnt doesn't do it like the record they get criticized um, and I think it's like that for bigger bands. I think that RNL um, with Journey has a harder role in some ways than Steve Perry would because people would be so loving and so forgiving if Steve just went up and tried, you know, yep. because he's just got so much love, you know, the, the people have so much love for him. Um, and then there's sometimes you see artists where you just think, I get that you're not able physically to do some of that stuff. There are, uh, everybody gets, everybody has limitations. The body is the body. And if you're a singer and there's not, there's, there's only so much you can do. You could do all the work and do all the warming up and get a great coach. And, and that helps a lot and it will help most people. But my, my criticism lies more in when I see people not trying if I see an older artist get up there and maybe they're, they're drunk or they just look like they're kind of calling it in or something to that degree, that's frustrating. But if they're really trying and they're not getting it, I have a lot more empathy and understanding and sympathy for that than, than to just kind of go up and especially the really big artists and just take the paycheck and yeah and just just try to show us that you are trying and that you care a little bit and that's well all. is there anybody more uh a better example than phil collins i mean i, mean, it, I gotta give the guy he huge. can't walk he yeah. is frail as can be and he's yeah. sitting in a chair yeah. and he's singing opuses yeah you know amazing Amazing. And, and, you know, um, Axl Rose with, uh, with ACDC. Um, I mean, you know, he didn't have to take the gig, but yeah. one, a once in a lifetime opportunity. And, you know, he killed it in my opinion. And I'm not the world's biggest Axl fan. Uh, sorry, everybody. Uh, well, I, he, I, he walked I, out on you, Tony. How can you be a fan? No, I do love the band. 
Um, in many ways, I love Slash and I love and I do like Axel. I, I I think they have great songs. But I'm just saying, um, you know, and he still goes up there and really at least tries, you know. So yeah, I think I think Phil Collins is uh, inspirational. Really, what he what he just did is crazy, you know. It was funny. I ran into Phil Collins once at um, in Tribeca, Brody. I don't know if I ever told you this. So obviously, Phil Collins is struggling a little bit now, walking with the cane. Uh, Tony, I know you don't know this. David does. I also walk with a cane. I have a neurological disability. I can show you my uh, my handicap logo tattoo. He, he has metal horns and a mohawk. Wow. So I, I I walk up to Phil Collins with my cane. Most people don't because I don't come off. I'm not in a, uh, a wheelchair or anything like that. They might think it's part of my gimmick. So Phil Collins is there with his cane, and he thought somebody set it up. Like somebody was like punking him. Like who is this kid with a cane wanting to take my like picture with me? But then he realized he's like, oh, yeah, he really has a problem. So that's my uh, pointless uh, Phil Collins. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look at look at uh, look at Glenn Tipton. You know, he's he's they, they I think they still bring him out a little bit. I'm not sure if they, if he comes out for a song or two or something, or if he yeah. maybe doesn't anymore. But uh, the encore usually some songs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Mick, Mick Mars can barely walk in Motley Crue, and he's yeah. he's getting out there on stage. I did have a Phil Collins story that I, that I thought would relate to you, Tony. We were uh, at our offices, and, and Phil was doing the radio tour thing, and uh, a bunch of us wanted to meet him for obvious reasons. And so we spoke to Brando's boss, and we said, hey, can we go down the hall and meet him when he's done? They said, sure. So his manager comes out, and he says, listen, we have a few minutes. He's got a very busy day scheduled today. He'd love to meet the four of you, but he's in, you know, he's not doing well. This is maybe five years ago. He's walking with a cane, a little bit frail at the time. He's like, so please go easy on him. Just get a picture with him real quick. And he's got to go. Not a problem. So he comes out and he walks down the ramp very gingerly with his cane. And uh, one of the guys that we're with is, has been talking for 20 minutes, the four of us, about every time he's ever seen him perform live. Oh, I saw him in Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, Madison Square Garden, Third Row, Westbury Music Fair. And he remembers every CD he ever had, every song, every encore, everything. We're like, okay, great. We're going to get our pictures. We're going to get out of here. And he approaches Phil as Phil's hobbling down the ramp, walks up to him and starts running off every concert he's ever seen of Phil Collins since the 70s. And Phil has that look like, I want to be cordial. I'm ready to fall over. <laughs> I, I, okay. And his manager's like, all right, guys, let's get some pictures. And he's going on about every show. And finally, I went up behind him and I said, if you don't take your picture, I'll fucking kill you. And he's like, huh, huh. like he lost it. He was such an, so enamored. And so I'm wondering, when <laughs> fans approach you, you obviously can't remember every concert you've ever done. But is there one that stands out or a fan that reminisced about something or, you know, talked your ear off about, an ex other than me, of course, who uh, about an experience where, like, you wanted to, you know, you had other people to say hello to and they were just so excited. All the time. All the time. I mean, even when I do these these shows, I've been doing the acoustic shows since uh, since last year. Um, you know, there's always uh, and it's amazing, you know, because you want to, you know, uh, I think it's also with 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 the COVID thing. It's been a little weirder, uh, but somebody will always come with a bigger stack of things for you to sign than anybody else, you know, and you just kind of see it and you go, Oh, that's so awesome. And you're flattered. And, and, and yet at the same time, you're like, I have a long line here. If I don't, if I stop and sign on every single record by this, that this guy brought, how am I going to, I'll be here all night and I have a show the next day I have to sleep, you know, but, um, I do my best. I always, when they have like a lot, I usually say pick your favorite, favorite three or five, you know, and I'll get those, I'll do those. And then, uh, you know, bring the others to the next show or I don't know, you know, I mean, right. I, I try to do the best I can. But, but do they ever tell you something that you have no memory of? Like you don't remember the performing time. there and yeah. All the time. Um, yeah, all the time. Uh, most of the time I remember where we played and, uh, you know, I, but I don't, I don't often remember venues unless they were something significant, like the Greek theater I remember playing, you know, wow. but, uh, but I probably don't remember what club we played in 
I don't know, a, a town somewhere. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Wait a minute. You didn't see me in the crowd at Lemoore's Far East in Queens in 1989? Come on. You, you got to send me a picture. I got to see what you look like back then. Oh, please. I had a mullet. I mean, didn't everybody? <laughs> no, I did not. I never had a mullet. No, you didn't. You had amazing hair. I had a <laughs> mullet and a, and a white leather jacket that my wife will still never let me forgive, forgive me for wearing. Uh, you know, I had, I had zipper pants on probably at that show. You know, the what, parachute pants, right, with the zippers all over them. I, did you okay? But as long as you didn't have a uh, a sequence glove, did you? No, no <laughs> sequence glove. No, no. I drew the line there. I yeah. drew the line there. That, that he says. We're, we're, we're rec- <laughs> we'll ask him when we're done recording. Uh, but speaking of, I guess shows. His wife. His wife's gonna come in from the side with a sequence glove. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in a bag, a little baggy. Funny. Uh, but speaking of shows and and speaking of acoustic, can you talk about like? What was the decision? Because I think it's really awesome to do acoustic versions, like David, you, you said you went to, and give your electric show. So what made the decision to just to do two? Like, is it oh, right. harder to prepare for both rather than be like, I'm just going to go on a, an acoustic tour? I'm just no. Go- okay. Part of, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, the, the how I started doing acoustic shows in around 2006 or seven, somewhere in there, uh, was uh, I was living in New York City and, and I would go see, uh, in fact, uh, David, uh, don't we have a mutual friend, Brandon Wild? Yes, yes. Um, and Brandon, Brandon is uh, one of these incredibly talented people that I've come across all through my career that deserved to be a very well-known, famous artist, great songwriter, great singer, great musician, great producer. And, um, but anyway, um, he was a friend of mine and he, um, he was playing these really great intimate shows and he introduced me to a whole group of people that were singer songwriters and they played these great little performances and I would just go be captivated and just think this is, I got to do this. I know that this is something I want to do to uh, make, to just enhance. It's the next chapter. I don't know where it's going to go. I'm not going to stop doing the other thing, but I, I feel like I need to do this. And I did, and I, I found it to be frightening as, as hell. Uh, and uh, the first, uh, I still get more scared doing an acoustic show than I do an electric show. Although I say that and I'm, I'm pretty nervous about the shows I have coming up, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's like Chris Cornell said, uh, that, that he forced himself to do it so that he could, uh, he wanted to get up on stage and just be completely naked, um, uh, musically and vocally, um, because there was just nowhere to hide. And I wanted to do that too. I didn't know he said that until later, but I had the same reasoning and I wanted to push myself to just uh, be able to sing great without any bells and whistles you know and so uh so that that's where it began and then I just kind of developed it more and more over the years and played with different people and uh different situations and um so when when uh when this whole thing ended with COVID um, I've done acoustic shows a lot over the years, and it was just a continuation of doing them. It's, it's uh, a great way to get out and, and see the fans. My acoustic show is totally different than my electric shows. I do different material. I do my own songs, but I do them differently. Um, that was something I did on purpose when I developed the acoustic show. I did not want to just do the typical hard rock band unplugged thing and just take the songs and play basically play them the same way with acoustic instruments. That wasn't enough for me. I wanted to do something special. So most of my songs have been reworked, uh, different keys, different arrangements. um, And that's all been on purpose to to capture the essence of the song. And what I learned quickly also from doing those in the very beginning was that, as I suspected, not a lot of my songs from TNT, from the TNT days worked acoustically because the guitar, was so important to the song. So I had to kind of, okay, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna work. Oh, well, I have to do that song. So let's just make it work, you know? Um, And, you know, as it turns out, stuff like Northern Lights and the acoustic version of that almost became more popular 
in, in some ways on its own than the original version on the original TNT album. Um, so I do that version all the time live and it goes over really well. But I love playing the acoustic shows. It's a more, it's an easier, more economical way for me to get out and play shows for people right now. And um, what, I'm, what I'm looking at and hoping for is that after I do M3 and Rock Timber, I'll be playing more electric shows across the country. So, um, but I don't want to stop ever doing the acoustic shows. I, I really enjoy them a lot. So, well, yeah. as someone as someone who got to see you, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Brando. As no. someone as someone I who saw you perform acoustically, it was the first time I had seen you live acoustically, and it was the first show I had seen for two years. I hadn't been to a concert since before the pandemic, and so when I went to your show, you were the motivation for me going because it was February, I think, and it was it was still that. Do I want to be around people? Do I wear my mask the whole show? Yeah. Do I want to be in a close? Because it was, you know, a decent sized hall, but it, w it was just weird for me to be there. And I thought, no, I'm going to go see Tony. Fuck it. I'm going. And the set was, I didn't know what to expect as far as your playlist. Yeah. You sprinkled in TNT songs, which were great, but you did cover songs and you did, you did all non TNT songs and, and overall, yes, 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 you did. Yeah. Yes, you did. There were, there was one, one or two people that were like, what, what? Yeah, but mo I mean, but if you noticed, and I'm sure you did, there were families along the wall who brought their kids yeah. and their kids were singing along and like it was a multi-generational thing. Yeah. And everybody, I would say almost everybody knew the deep cuts. They knew, yeah. they knew what you were doing and the, the arrangements were fun. And mm -hmm. it just, you could, I don't know if your voice could have held up, but you could have done another three hours. We were all captive. We were just, it was like, oh, we're at a live show and there's Tony and the band sounded great. The acoustics were good in that place. And it was just like, I don't want to go home. Like after we talked and you signed, you know, everybody, you took pictures with everybody. I was just standing there going, I don't want to leave. It was such a, it was oh, almost God. like a, like a kumbaya, like you kept, you mentioned before, but it was like a, a family moment where like, I didn't know any of these people. They could have COVID for all I knew, but I knew that they loved the same music I did. And it was just such a warm, like we were all in it together kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. I think, I think, uh, Thank you for saying all that. It means a lot to me. Um, it's something I take, I take a lot of pride in my acoustic show and I see it, like I said, I see it as a completely different animal. And so I approach it that way as well. Um, the songs I do, how, what I say on stage, just everything about it is, it's a different thing. Um, I, I feel, well, okay, so if you're stripped down musically as you are with the acoustic setting, uh, I think that when I get up there to do those shows, I'm also a lot more the person you'd, you'd know offstage. Um, whereas when I go do the electric show, I feel like I have to be this, I don't know, rock star character that's not really me, you know? I mean, I do know people who don't turn that off and they're like that all the time and they're really hard to be around. No, I'm not going to mention any names, but... Uh, I, I I like the character. I like doing the rocks, the rock guy and the electric shows. It's fun. But um, yeah, there's something to be said for the honesty and the truthfulness and nakedness of, of the vocal part of the acoustic shows and the the personality part of it too. It just it is connecting. It's connecting to the fans. I'm right there. There's just a different I love it. You know, it's it's great. And I assume you're going to be adding more shows because now people can check out. Yeah, uh, this is all yeah. If you go to my, if you go to, if you go to my website, um, just click on the menu bar, and you'll see all the shows are that that are current are up there, and you can purchase tickets. Um, and whenever I am allowed to add a show, I add it. Um, there are some shows I know that are going to happen, but I can't announce them yet. But uh, yeah, they're just going to keep getting at it. As long as people will have me, I will probably drag my ass up on stage. <laughs> and I believe it's the, the M3 Rock Festival that you're getting inducted, right? So are yeah. you preparing a, a speech, your heavy metal speech? You're going to wing it? Look, what, I just mean, the, high only, the only thing that's great about it for me is uh, my set 
at M3 is not easy. So I'm going to look forward to any opportunity to, to, to not sing for a couple minutes. And so I'll probably just take advantage of, of that moment to, uh, I'll make it short and sweet. Trust me. I haven't even thought about it. So it's interesting that you said that. I suppose I should probably uh, put something in my head together, but we'll see. Okay. Well, congratulations. Well, yeah. Congratulations. It's, it's, it's a big deal. And it, um, I had sent you something a couple of months ago and, uh, I don't know if you had a chance to follow up, but I wanted to bring it up now. Uh, the show Peacemaker on HBO Max, directed and written by James Gunn, who did the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Yeah. Turns out he's a big fan of 80s metal. And so the entire soundtrack is 80s metal and modern Nordic metal. So they call it sleaze metal. It's all Swedish and Norwegian bands that sound like 80s metal. Wow. That yeah. that have so there's for instance there's a band called a band called Wigwam Wigwam yeah I know the, yeah, yeah so I I didn't know who they were and I so I heard the the theme song to the show and I thought is this an 80s metal band I I missed along the way like a undiscovered band and my friends are on Facebook saying who the hell is this a band we missed that played Lamore and we didn't go to see them at night and they were 2010 and 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 now band they sound that, like 80s. But there's a huge insurgence of 80s metal in in uh, in the Nordic countries. Uh, I'm sure you guys were influential in that. So how do we get yeah. your song on Peacemaker season two? Ah, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll I'll start working on that. Yeah, um, but have have you heard this music? And does it does it sound weird to hear new music that sounds like you know your your beginnings? Well, I do know of, of a movement that's been going on in Scandinavia for at least a decade of newer bands like, like Heat, which is yep. where uh, the singer that Skid Row got came from. Um, and uh, there's another band called the Wild, Wild something. Uh, yes. Uh, and you... Dynasty is with a Z. There's, there's yeah. a bunch of bands and they're doing, they sound great. Yeah. But it's weird because they sound like, they sound like the 80s, but you're like, I don't know these songs, but they sound like I should. Yeah. Back. Back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a big way. I see it. There, there are American bands doing it too. So I, I think we will see what I've been hoping for is that one of these younger bands will break open, you know, really big. Um, and all of a sudden we'll have yet another 80s resurgence to keep us uh, old guys going for another, you know, till we. <laughs> you know, it's funny because, you know, you think uh, the Rolling Stones are still out there doing it. Paul McCartney's still out there doing it. And and Paul's got some hard material, you know, to sing. And, uh, uh, you know, the Stones, some of that stuff. But I'd say Mick Jagger's, his moving is more impressive than anything else that he's doing on stage. Is is He's like forever young, that guy. But... Uh, Maybe not so challenging vocally for, for his age, but uh, but the stuff that most of us 80s guys did, you know, as you start to get into your, I'm not there yet, but when I imagine when I start to get towards 70, I'm going to let go, man, I want to just, I want to get on a stool and do a marathon yeah. every night. You, you yeah. said your M3 set is challenging. I'm trying to think of what you would consider your hardest songs. Would it would it be like oh, Everyone's awesome. a Star or Shine All On? Okay. All, all of them. I mean, I was actually telling the band at rehearsal last week, there's no breaks. It's not like, oh, let me pace the set so that it's, there's no way to pace it. You know, it's just, it, it means, so I'm doing my best, but you know, it's just go, 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 you know, and, and it's, it's intense, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's all the, I wanted to make sure I did all the, all the most known TNT songs. So that's what I'm doing. Wow. How long are you, do you, what are your vocal warm ups? Do you do the ah. scales? Like, what's your vocal, vocal? My vocal warm ups have to entail, have to entail weeks and months, you know, going into uh, something like this. So I've been singing, uh, but I'm also taking care, uh, you know, not to sing too hard. So I have a rehearsal uh, Wednesday this week, and then I have a show Thursday in Huntsville, it's like a warm up show for M3. And then we'll assess everything and we'll probably do one more rehearsal before M3 next week. And, uh, you know, uh, I just do my best. 
I, I can't, you know, okay. that's all I can do is, is with my, with the power that I have. It is funny because I, I did not get a bad case of COVID. I may have had a light case of it at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, but I have not been down for the count other than the reactions I've had to a couple of uh, the vaccines that I've gotten. But um, ironically, a couple of weeks ago, I went up to Maine and, and uh, uh, Massachusetts for a couple of shows and I was uh, lax with my mask wearing and I got the flu. It was not COVID. I took two COVID tests when I got back and I got really sick with the flu. Like it was a bad flu. So people forget you could still get other things. Sure. Right? Well, knock on wood, it's, that's as bad as it gets for you. Uh, because next oh. time, David, please invite me to go see Tony next time he plays in New York. 100%. Okay. Yeah, October. Of course. Just keep it. I can't say when yet or where, but just October, I'll, I'll be back. Okay. Well, well, I'll be there, and I'm going to drag Brando, so not to okay. worry. Okay. Oh I, oh, I love that. Tony, thank you so much for your time. This was a, a pleasure to meet you, to speak with you. I know you and David go back. You guys are BFFs, always Snapchatting each other. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your friendship today. My brother from another mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Tony. Much appreciated. Thanks for uh, Thank finding time for, for both of us. We appreciate it. And I guess I will see you in October, wherever that might be. Yes, I'll let you know for sure. Okay. And thank, thank you guys you. very much. I appreciate it. I had a lot of fun today. Great. Awesome. Thank you. So that does it for this episode of Appetite for Distortion. When will you see the next one? Well, in the words of Axel Rose concerning Chinese democracy, you'll see it, I don't know, as soon as the word.